Collins. I'm publisher editor of Nashville Wine Press, and I'm going to tell you right now, please start eating your dessert. <laughs> I'm a wine writer. I'm used to people not listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an honor for me to be here tonight um, to introduce uh, and speak about, I should say, uh, the Norman M. Lippman Award recipient, Michael Broadman, as well as his, his son Bartholomew, who is here. And, and I have to tell you, trying to surmise the accomplishments of these two men is very, very difficult. So if this seems a bit verbose, blame them, because their accomplishments are many. So, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Michael Broadman first, so you know, if you don't know his background. He was trained as an architect. Um, he then changed careers and became uh, part of the wine trade. And suddenly with that, constructed a resume that's, you know, quite frankly, it's unparalleled. After 13 years in the wine trade, he helped jumpstart Christie's Wine Auction, making it the premier wine auction house across the world. He started uh, pioneered wine auctions in Amsterdam, Geneva, Sydney, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and the United States. And that alone is an amazing accomplishment. But now I'm going to get into some of his wine writing, which he is very well known for, as well as his lecturing. 2003, he received the Wine Literary Award for 50 years of wine writing and also a James Beard Award for his book called Vintage Wine Book. He's been given the Glenn Fittich Wine Writer of the Year Award and the Senior Wine Consultant for British Airways, named Decanter's Man of the Year and added to Wine Spectator's Hall of Fame in 2002. And he does not just hold the title Master of Wine, but he actually was a past chairman for the Institute. He's received a plethora of distinguished, distinguished, uh, distinguished awards in France I'm actually too embarrassed to try to pronounce because I haven't spoken French since my French been year of college. So, you know, actually, Bart found me the one award that's missing from your father. And he's obviously a, was very, and is very successful at everything that he does as footballer of the year. <laughs> my guess is that had he gone into soccer, as we like to call it here at the States, he would have had the chief team of his choice in the Premier League and represented Native England in the World Cup for many, many World Cups. Now, think about Bartholomew. He has to follow in his father's footsteps. Well, not an easy task, but Bartholomew has followed very, very well. He's responsible, Bartholomew, for the growing interest of port and Madeira in North America in the 1980s. Founded Broadbent Selections in 1996, uh, which has a family of wineries across the world, including the newest, the newest edition called Dragon's Hollow, which is dubbed the first good wine out of China. Mr. Broadbent's 50% owner in that venture, and a few additional accolades of Bartholomew and for Broadbent selections are uh, Decanto Magazine's 50 Most Influential People in the World, one of Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Fastest Growing Companies, nominated for Imported, Importer of the Year by Wine Enthusiast, as well as nominated for Small Business Person of the Year by Small Business Association, and founder of La Cademe du Vin, that's my French, of Toronto. <laughs> which is a branch, if you're familiar with Stephen Spurrier, the head of Major um, as well. So, again, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, like his father, received numerous French awards, and I'm not going to bastardize those pronunciations. <laughs> so, here in Nashville, we're the songwriting capital of the world, right? We love a good story. We love metaphor. We, we love analogy. We love to connect with things that warm our hearts. Well, in songwriting, we have this little thing called bookends, if you're familiar, and that's what we do is crafting a situation that's tied neatly at the end of the chorus or the end of the song. Okay? So in that spirit, I find it very serendipitous that we have Robert Lippmann presenting an award in his father's name to Bartholomew Broadman in honor of his father, Michael. So please welcome Bartholomew Broadman. <laughs> escaped me the symbolism of accepting the award from someone representing his father to someone representing his father. Um, I must say I'm fortunate that my father is still alive um, at the age of 82, and he is very uh, sad not to be here this evening. Um, he is greatly honored uh, by this award, and he actually tried to send me a, um, a, a, a very nice auction lot, the auction tonight, um, but I had to tell him it wasn't tonight, it was too much of it. Um, so maybe we'll send something next year. We'll certainly keep contributing on his behalf. 
um, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's sorry he couldn't be here because um, a number of reasons. Well, primarily because he's 82 and he's um, had heart failure, uh, had, a couple of, had a major heart surgery a couple of years ago, and just, time has just told him that he has to slow down and can't jump on a plane every time he gets an award. Um, but he's a great lover of life, lover of wine. Lover of, people think he drinks a lot of wine, but he actually talks about how little he drinks. And seeing him in, in growing up, he, they really don't drink a lot, um, my parents. They, they don't drink anything much during the day. Well, morning time, they always have, <laughs> they always have um, champagne for breakfast. Because, I find that the orange juice is just so boring without champagne. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, then they, they go on, they don't have anything really until, well, at Christie's, my father always complained about the morning coffee at Christie's, so he always had a glass of Madeira instead. So. <laughs> um, but nothing before, nothing until lunch. Well, well, before lunch, Bloody Mary or something like that. <laughs> and sherry, often. But obviously with lunch, he'd have it's part of his meal is it's white wine, red wine, and then pour it after lunch. <laughs> but nothing really until dinner time, well, except the tea at Christie's at 4 o'clock. So we soon have more Madeira. Um, but then nothing until dinner, which, well, 6 o'clock is the time you're allowed to start drinking um, in England, but they really waited before dinner, we eat late then. He wouldn't have his gin tonic or whiskey till about 7.30. <laughs> um, then he would have, um, obviously, wine, red, white wine, red wine, and uh, port for dinner. Um, and, but his doctor was concerned that he wasn't drinking enough, so um, for his heart, his doctor said he must have something to, before he went to bed, red so he always had a, a, a liqueur. Sure. <laughs> but really, I, it's interesting that that is his daily routine, and I've never seen my parents um, drunk. Um, actually, maybe I've never seen them sober. <laughs> but anyway, that is the way they are, and, um, and that is the message I want to convey, that we should all be drinking all the time. With um, <laughs> that, I will leave you, and thank you so much for this very, very generous yeah. award, and my parents are really very, very, very honoured, and thank you very much.